Hey coach, welcome. I'm glad you found us on YouTube. Let me know how I can help you. I've coached for 30 years, won a lot of championships. You can see behind Coach MBA guys. I am here to help. I started teachhoops.com to help coaches just like you through this great journey we call basketball coaching. It's got more resources and I think the best part is our community and our resources that we have. You'll get my personal email address. We can get on a phone call. Teachhoops.com is the answer for your coaching journey. Let me let me know how I can help you and enjoy the video. One. All right. Welcome to Coach Unplugged. And Patrick, I'm going to tell you that I'm not sure where we're going to fall on the numbers when this goes up. Uh, we're going to be in probably the six, seven hundreds as far as number of podcasts I've done. Um, but uh, very excited. Uh, you know, I, I'm, I'm super, Tim Rice is one of the great guys in this, in this, in this profession. And he's, uh, he's done a lot of great things over in Ireland and has connected me with some of the great coaches and, and trainers and stuff in Ireland. So I really do appreciate that. Cause like I said, it's on my, that's on my bucket list, definitely to go visit. But, um, so coach, I'm going to have you introduce yourself, kind of tell your basketball journey. Um, where you started, you know, kind of where, where you started and how we got to the point where we're sitting here, um, seven hours away from each other, um, talking basketball. So if you can do that, that'd be great. No problems. Um, bit of a late developer as a player. I didn't really get into it until I went to secondary school. Um, I come from a really small village in, in County Kerry, which is in the Southwest of Ireland. Um, you know, population of about 450 and during the winter it's a ghost town, there might be two cars on the street. So, um, but Kerry's a, a well-known Gaelic county. So, uh, <laughs> okay. So, First of all, yeah. I've learned, I've, I've learned a lot about it's Gaelic, it's Gaelic and what's, uh, what are the Gaelic, what are the sports again? Erling. Like, yeah. And, and Erling and Gaelic football. Yes. Yeah. Like YouTube them for people that are listening to this YouTube. Yeah. Them. Like I, when two years ago when I started interviewing some people from, I had no idea. Like I kind of had seen them, but um, cool sports. But anyway, they're, they're, they're like king in Ireland. Yeah. Absolutely. And particularly football in, in where I come from, it's, it, you know, it's a religion. It really is. It's, it's like basketball in Lithuania. I was lucky enough to, to go there and do a few clinics and stuff. And um, you know, it, it, it is an absolute religion. So there was a kid who went to boarding school who came back during the summer and he started playing basketball and a few of us got joined in and eventually then we got a school team going and kind of moving from there. Um, it wasn't until I went to college that I, I kind of really got into it, uh, joined the basketball club, um, started assistant coaching probably my second year because our head coach got real sick, um, wasn't able to travel to away games. Um, Coaching basketball in college and universities over here is very different to, to your experience of it. Um, you know, there's, there's no department. You're a volunteer in 90% of the cases and you have no backup. Or if you, you do now, it's a, you're, you're kind of lucky. Back then, there was no such thing as an assistant coach. You did everything. You were team manager. You washed the kits. You got them ready. You organized the game schedule. Like, Fantastic education, and and uh, you know it, it, it's a real eye opener. And I, I look at some of the the programs around now that are developing, and programs particularly in the states. And I just think, oh, how, how. I mean, it, it, your university system is even not even like our high school system in the sense that high school coaches yeah. here get paid and have assistance and. Um, yeah, I mean, the, 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 and we, I've gone through this in other uh, podcasts, so we don't have to do it, but the, just the system of how it kind of goes through is so unique um, that it's different. And I think, I think you're, I think it's starting to turn the corner um, as far as getting young kids to play. I think that's a huge thing in Ireland right now. You know, it is a very popular sport, particularly in primary schools. Like it's, it's either one or two across the country now. Right. But, Big, the big thing is the transition to keep them going into secondary school. So you're equivalent to high school. Right. Uh, high, and it's just trying to hold on to them, particularly girls. We have a massive drop off in girls once they hit the teenage years. Um, and it's, you know. I, I and I don't know if that's Ireland based. That's here in the States. Too. Yeah. That yeah, does I happen. Um, it is worldwide. But, but I think, I think it's interesting. I think that's interesting in the sense that, you, yeah, you got to. <laughs> I've said this a billion times, but it's like, you got to make it fun and you got to hook them early. Like, yeah. you know, um, and then to be honest with you in a small, in a relatively small country like yours, 
they got to play multiple sports. Like you got to convince yeah. them that more than one sport's important. Um, oh, hundred percent. Firm believer. You know, my my son, six foot seven, playing Division One National League here, playing college ball. Uh, and, you know, I, I didn't let him touch a basketball or only a basketball until he was about 16. You know, uh, up to that stage, he, he did lots of different things because I'm a real believer in, in that multi-sport. Well, it's, that, it's, the, it's the different movements, I think. You know what I mean? Yeah, I absolutely. think it, it's, that's what people don't realize. It's like, and especially because your son's a, a big body, that I think sometimes those big bodies, when they only do one thing, that same muscle, the muscle memory is what causes the injuries because they're only doing – they're only using the same systems over and over and over again. Um, so if you only drive your car in the city, it's your car is going to have some issues because it's stop, start, stop, start, stop, start. You know, if you're only driving on the highway, it might have yeah. different. It's the same thing with kind of with the player, I think. Um, yeah. That's why I tell parents, it's like play as many. First of all, don't, don't choose for them. They'll find what they love. And then um, as many as, as many as possible, teach us so many life lessons in my opinion. Um, oh yeah, 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 absolutely. Because you, unless you're the, unless you're the, you know, a, a freak of nature, you're, you're there's going to be sports you're great at, and there's sports you're good at, and um, so what are you doing now? Now I work as a basketball development officer, so I'm one of, of five basketball development officers uh, who work with the NGB uh, Basketball Ireland. So my role is is um, it's part funded by Basketball Ireland, and then I'm also uh, employed by Ulster University. So um, the way my role kind of kind of works is I spend half my week working on development programs, coaching in in schools, um, helping run technical courses, that side of things, and then the other half of my week is in the university. So it's specifically around uh, social um, and intramural basketball, and then okay. I the the varsity teams so there are top level teams at the university so this year i'm coaching the girls previous years i've coached both guys and girls on similar years but we're lucky enough we've got a young a young coach who's come back from the uk and he's coaching our men's national league team and he's yeah. also coaching our, our university team so um the other big difference which you've probably gone into is is here we have a massive club system um yeah. <laughs> that's you know colleges is great and you play your college league but for us college league is five or six games Right. Uh, we've got our intervarsity tournament uh, in April, which unfortunately we're missing this year. But um, that's kind of our NCAA March Madness, except we do it over three days. Right. So, you know, the top eight teams will come and play. You'll be in two pools. You'll play a couple of games on a Friday, a couple of games on a Saturday, and then final on a Sunday if you're lucky enough to get there. So it's pretty intense. We have a lot of Americans who come over. Um, we're lucky enough to be involved with a, a program called Sport Changes Life. Um, and through them, they bring scholars over here to Ireland. So about 2022, 20, I think, last year. And they're in different colleges all around. And, um, you know, a lot of them have come from Division One, Division Two, or Division Three background from the States and, and are here doing a graduate degree, Masters. Okay. And so, and what we try and do then is we, you know, a big part of, you know, part of what I wanted to talk to you a little bit about today was integrating those players into a very different culture over here um, and I thought it might be something that particularly your you know your college coaches uh, might be interested in because yeah, I think it would be great yeah so yeah, if you need to share that to share the screen or do it ever let that'd be perfect I think that's that's very intriguing to me yeah um okay well look we'll get that we'll get that started uh so we will all right you good in that one perfect Okay, so I kind of just wanted to talk a little bit about our culture. Um, so for me, I, I took over the women's team. Um, let's make sure that this is working. There we go. Um, I took over the women's team. Um, I kind of want to talk a little bit about best practice, what worked, what didn't, and then the kind of pillars underpinning. Okay. So it was about three years ago I took over our women's national league team. Um, so in a way, who does the national league team play? Do you go to Europe and play? Do you go to like, no, no. So, so super league is the top level here for men or women. Okay. And there's uh, 10 teams in the women's super league. And then there's, I think 11 teams uh, in the men's super league. Okay. And the next level down is division one national league. Okay. National league. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So, and uh, so our, our, the goal of all the teams in division one is, is to, to win division one and move up to super league. So it's a promotion relegation. Yeah, it's like it's like um, it's like uh, 
it's like soccer. It's like the uh, Premier League. Yeah, yeah. You win. Yeah. I, I'm. I'm. I've. I don't know who I was talking to. I. I'm just surprised the U.S. hasn't moved to that system in some respects. Um, yeah, it, it definitely makes things more competitive. Um, you know, and and you, your your culture and how you approach it. You know, it. it it's not just oh, I can be safe. This might be a bad year because I didn't recruit that well or whatever. Right. You know, you're, you're always aiming to get there. And when you get there, you're always aiming to stay there. You can't afford to have a bad year because then you go back down. So. Right. Yeah. Yeah. And it does put that, that little bit more pressure on you to, to do your job right, to make sure you recruit right. And, and a big part for us over here, because so, so much of it is volunteer led that, you know, it's about developing a, a culture that people will buy into. Right. And now you can, you can play only one U.S. Is that right? Only one U.S. player at a time. So in the men's, it's only one. In the women's, it's two. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So, um, yeah, so I, I did coach the men's, uh, and uh, we had a very successful year, 16, 17. And then we got a men's coach into the club, um, and we got the opportunity to put a women's coach in. Okay. Women's team in the National League. Uh, we were very young, um, but we were at that stage where we felt if we didn't take the step as a club, we were going to miss out on it. So um, we, we did that. Uh, our first year, you know, was was a real learning experience. You know, you went three and nine. You finished third from the bottom in the league. And um, it was tough, particularly for the younger girls. Um, so one of the, you know, one of the things that I have there is about the youth. You know, we, we, we our girls can start playing from 16. So okay. we, we had a couple of underage Irish internationals. Um, but our profile of a team was we, we had, you know, six girls that were under 21. So, and, and out of our 12, that's a lot. And then we had a lot of girls that were just early 20s, and then we had a couple mid 20s, and then Americans. Yeah. So, um, first year was, was a real learning experience. Uh, second year, we really grew. Um, we, we started to click. Um, we were lucky enough to get an awesome, uh, well, two awesome girls. But one in particular was a girl called Collins Scarborough from Siena. Um, and she just dominated in our league. You know, 5'10", rebound, you know, she averaged 25 and 15, and she just tore up teams. And she brought a lot of a, a lot of that winning competitive, uh, you know, mentality to our team. Right. Is there something when you're on the men's side or the women's side that you're looking for in a player? Yeah, I, I guess, you know, for us, we're a little bit different in the fact that we're a university team. So we do have a lot of kids who come here to university for a couple of years not necessarily on a basketball scholarship, um, but they'll just come here to go to university. You know, we have a really good academic uh, program. And then from that, uh, like they might go home after three years when they finished and got their degree. And so, how long does it take them? It takes them three years to get the degree? Either three or four, depending on, on the particular uh, course that you're doing. So for an undergraduate degree. Um, some oh, of them undergrad. Yeah, yeah. Undergrad. Places. Okay. Yeah, for the year of placement. Yeah, so. Dude, but some, but some come over and play in the national, or they play in the what? What do they play in? They let's say they finish their collegiate career in U.S. and then they come over. Almost exclusively, exclusively, it's either Super League if they're good enough, and okay. they're they're picked by those clubs, or Division One National League. Division One National League, okay. And then when they're doing that in Division One National League, they're probably going to school. Uh, yes, for a lot of the clubs, they're going to school or. In the past four years where, you know, the, the country has come out of a recession a little bit, it's gotten to the stage where clubs can afford to, to pay a certain amount to bring those players in, provide them with opportunities to coach in schools and, and do stuff like that to supplement their income. Um, okay. okay. It's not well paid at all. Um, so let's right. be clear about that. But it is a fantastic experience and a stepping stone for those players. That want and how them. long does it take them? Let's say if they're doing it to get their – how long does it take that to get their their uh, their – well, well, the kids that come in with us, uh, it, you see, that's the other big advantage that they look to come over here. And we get a lot of really good kids, particularly on the women's side, who have come over here through the Sport Changes Life uh, Victory Scholarship. Right. It's one year as opposed to two years. That's there. what I was saying. It's like, yeah, they can come over, get their degree in one year. And yeah. Yeah. And, and, and their life experience here, I think, is a big part that, you know, coaches in the States will look at it and say, OK, they're going to come over here. They're going to coach youth teams. They're going to have to be, you know, an assistant coach uh, sometimes on other teams. So a lot of a lot of the girls will assistant coach on the guys. The guys will assistant coach on the girls, depending on how many resources a particular club or university has. Um, and then they're also team managers. You know, they got to take roles and responsibilities for for helping promote social recreational basketball. So for a lot of the kids, 
particularly the D1 kids, it, it's a new experience for them. Right. Uh, oh, I bet. It's, it, yeah, it's like graduate assistant by five in one year, if you know what I mean. So, right. Well, and they also can, you know, go to school and yeah, that's a exactly. great, that's a great experience. And, and it, it, that, that's part of the life skills, you know, so it's, it's that learning, it's that, you know, having that time management to be able to, to balance your schoolwork with having to play and train and lead the teams and, and then do you fulfill your coaching. But the other big thing that Sport Changes Life do is the kids they bring over, they do a lot of community work. So it's part of right. their, their deal. So they, they do a lot of work in the community working with disadvantaged youth. Okay. Yeah. So it's, it's, it's real. A lot of kids have gone back, have gone on, you know, have become uh, assistant coaches pretty quickly, have gone to work for some big organizations, um, you know, some of the bigger accountancy firms and, uh, some are working like NCAA women's committee and uh, well part of it's just like so, and for some of those kids they can't like if you're an athlete in college it's harder to study a quote-unquote study abroad um yeah. so that's a great experience for a lot of them yeah 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 absolutely and for us then you know particularly when they're when they're over here and they're playing you know some of the kids come over and particularly the girls because I, I do think you know up to now our female basketball in Ireland has been of a higher standard than people may have realized. Right. We've had we've had some Division One college teams come over here and tour and get beaten by our Irish senior women's team. Right. I'm going. All right. Hold on. You know, this is a country the size of our city. And right. <laughs> so, um, but we're we're sending a lot of kids over over to the states. You know, I'm, I'm lucky enough. One of the girls from our program has uh, just signed uh, with Houston Baptist University. Okay. She's gone there. She did a year of prep school last year at the Hunt. Well, let's hope she gets to come and go to school. Yeah. Sure. Yeah. Uh, so, uh, yeah, we are a lot more kids going over, um, going over to the States and, and learning their craft and then bringing it back home. So. And, and I think that's part of it. I mean, I think that's what happened with um, NBA basketball in the 80s and stuff, you know, the Michael Jordan era. I mean, it became a worldwide sport more than at that point, I think. Um, yeah. And then people, you know, I mean, you look at the NBA now, it's, I mean, it's like a third is U.S. residents, I think, um, yeah. or citizens. Uh, but that, that wasn't the way it was, you know, 30 years ago. So I think that makes it, I think it makes it better for everybody, to be honest with you. Yeah, I agree. And, uh, you know, I, the last thing you want is that dominance of one team the whole time. And right. You know, they're the most talented and, and you guys have been phenomenally successful at that. But it's not nice to see teams competing right um and part of that is, you know sending kids over and, and taking advantage of of the expertise over there so um there's not a lot of expertise here so a lot of our kids do go abroad whether it's to an academy in europe uh, or the uk or they'll end up going going to the states so okay both of them all right keep going i don't mean to interrupt them yeah not at all no. <laughs> uh it you know it ties in nicely like you can see there so you know just yeah. look experience when we're such a young team it's important that we get good leaders um when we when we get recruit these kids to come in um and when they join on the program uh, we don't actually get to pick you know the the scholars that are coming to us they're assigned by the the charitable foundation we okay. can see like a guard or we'd like a post or, or that kind of thing but it, it there's a lot of factors that go into it you know their major versus the, the scholarship or masters that are offered in our university and that side of things but We've been lucky the last couple of years to have some really good kids. Um, and uh, yeah, so it, it's that experience, it's kind of developing it. So for me, it was about integrating Americans and having a new set of Americans every season. So trying to understand and, and, and quickly adjust uh, to, to get them to adjust to our, our system, which is a lot of, a lot of really self, you know, self-control. They have to be very disciplined. Um, you know, their hands aren't held for them. You know, I, I'll never forget one of one of the girls um, a number of years ago turning around and saying, you know, somebody got my chewing gum. And I said, what do you mean somebody got your chewing gum? And she goes, well, every time I played a game, she played for a big D1 college. Uh, it was a graduate assistant who handed her a chewing gum just as she got ready in the middle of a warm-up. Like it was that level of, of uh, you know, uh, I don't want to say molly coddled, but there's a bit of that definitely about it, so. Um, and, and it's a big adjustment. So when they come over, they bring that experience. Uh, we try and, and develop them as well for, you know, just to, to help them take that next step from college moving on to, to life. And then uh, from the basketball point of view, for me, it was just about trying to figure out ways to, to make that integration happen quicker and right. then for, for that experience to translate onto the court. So, um, 
I probably didn't spend as much time as I should have around the team building aspect. And that was something I really picked up when I was when I was looking at coach with national teams. And um, you know, we spoke earlier about uh, Dr. Kim Rice, and he was one of the guys who who uh, mentored me a little bit when I was on my on my journey with the under eighteen women national team a couple of seasons ago. So. Um, and part of that was about team building. So the first thing I learned is, is we try and do an overnight in the first week or two. You know, we bring everybody away. We, we will have some fun together, do some games, get our training in as well. And it's just about, you know, starting to develop that team bond. It's that relationship building that's so important. Yeah. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Um, and and that, that's been a big change in my coaching. You know, for years, I always thought I was a pretty good games coach. I could read a game pretty well and make adjustments, see them out there. Um, but probably the biggest development for me over the last, you know, eight, nine years has been around being more athlete-centered. And I'm trying to get to that stage where I can trust them to do more peer coaching. And I'm trying right. to put that in. Uh, but, I, I, you know, I, I do struggle with it. It's one of these things that it's you just you just see it and you want to correct it rather than letting them figure it out on their own so um yeah i i I always say there's like especially for the young coaches there's basically three levels there's self-coaching where i coach myself there's peer coaching which i help others and they help me and then there's coaching coaching which is what i'm coaching to the players that third one is probably the least important um as far as if I, if you can teach your players to self coach and you can tell to help them peer coach, oh my gosh, you're, you're light years ahead. Um, I, if I can sit and watch and just, you know, I, I call it like a puppet, ma- if you can just be the person just moving the pieces around on a chessboard, um, it's so much easier than if you're doing the big things. Because um, if you're always self correcting, it's not going to work. It just doesn't. You're right. I, I, I think it's a difficult, but that's a difficult skill to learn too, I think. Oh, yeah, yeah. And I, I don't know if anybody ever gets it. You know, it's yeah. one, one of those evolving ones because you know, talking to coaches and, and even listening to, to some of your podcasts, like the kids have changed and they do change. And, and as they're changing, you have to adapt to that and move with it. Right. Yeah. So, yeah. Yeah. You mean coaching? Yeah. I was talking to a coach a couple of days ago. It's like if I was coaching the way I was 30 years ago, shoot. I mean, it's not, it, it, the game's changed. The kids have changed. I mean, you have to, you know, I always say people used to go to school in a horse and buggy. They don't anymore, right? Things change. So it's yeah. inevitable. <laughs> um, yeah. Uh, okay. All right. So just keeping it rolling on and yep. around talent. So a uh, big thing for me was identifying, you know, the roles that I, I could develop with the girls. So right. It was, it was trying to figure out what were the best systems to put in place to suit their skills with a little bit of tweaking so that it fitted in with my overall philosophy. Okay. Uh, whereas I think when I was a younger coach, you know, in, in my 20s, I, I really kind of shoehorned people. I talk a little bit more about that later where I just said, you know, this is the style that I like to play because, you know, it's whatever. It's not yeah. the many coaches are doing it in this country at the time. And these are certain sets that we like to run because, you know, teams will struggle with it. And I tried to shoehorn the players into it rather than tweaking and, and making it a little bit better. So, um, and I guess, you know, I, I have always been big on self-reflection and uh, I've been very lucky to have some really good mentors here that I could reach out to, you know, kind of discuss day-to-day stuff, discuss bigger picture stuff. And coming out of that, you know, I, I believe it's probably one of the biggest and I know you, you preach it all the time, it's, it's just about, you know, talk to people, get that expertise, have that conversation, and you never know when something little will click, and it's like a light bulb going off. And go off. I mean, it's literally why I started the podcast like three, four years ago. It's like I was having one of those reflect, it's like, I, uh, it's like I almost feel like I'm not as good a coach as I was 20 years ago. It's like the more you know, the sometimes the more you don't know. Yeah. <laughs> And, you you know, and there's so many people that want to share this great game because there's so many lessons to be taught um, that, yes, external X. I mean, people want to help. I mean, if someone emails me, I respond. I always I'm not always able to get right back to them, but I'm, I'm always willing to help. That's the thing is I think that's what coaches want. I mean, we're coaches for a reason. We're not like, um, you know, we want to help people. And yeah, absolutely. But yeah, I think that's one thing this this past you know couple of months has really shown. Like it's been fantastic, you know, the podcast, the webinars, the coaching yeah. that have gone online, and like all almost all of these have been free, and it's just people wanting to share their expertise. It's almost uh, I've said this too. It's almost too much. Like 
like I almost feel like if I, I had to stop watching some of the what because it's like oh crap we should do th-. I mean it's it's almost too much noise you know what I mean um so I've been trying to do it in smaller pieces like okay I'm gonna watch this today and think about this otherwise it's like oh my gosh it's like I, it's almost overwhelming but it's great it is great but it's almost yeah. overwhelming yeah, yeah. I, I, for me defense is, is a particular focus it was this season and, and moving into next year for me and, and it's just something that's, Offensively, we've been very solid. You know, a lot of possessions, either the top scoring or the second top scoring team in the league um, for the past couple of seasons. But it's, it's our defense that I'm, I'm really focused on. So a lot of what I've been looking to listen to and watch have been around kind of defensive culture, different types of systems that are working. And uh, I find myself taking a lot of notes and saying, right, okay, do I think that will work? Do I think this will work? And um, as we get into the summer, I'll kind of have to actually start sitting down and working out you know, which ones I'm going to try this season or not. So. Yeah, and then, I mean, it's, it's, so you'll have an idea of 90, 90% of your roster. You won't know the two American kids or whatever they're coming over. Yeah. Okay. So it's, it's a, so you have a little bit of a harder equation in the sense that, like, I kind of have a sense who's coming on my team next year, so I can kind of sit and start moving pieces. You have a couple pieces that aren't there, and you, you're not going to really know. That's harder. To, to do it stuff. is, uh, yeah, and, and I won't find out until until like June, July, and, and we start our, our preseason on court in August. So okay, a lot of time to figure out. And and the big big probably biggest challenge is, you know, those two pieces that are coming in are normally our, our top scorers. You know, they're the top two players that we'll have. Right. Um, I have some really good Irish talent, um, but the whole point of bringing them in is that they're better than what we have in order to kind of, you know, lift us up and, and make us competitive with the other teams. So, right. Um, so, yeah, so, you know, that's, that's kind of the way that we've been looking at it. Um, biggest question I kind of asked myself then, it was, you know, is what does it look like to me? So, uh, so what is, what is the culture? What, what is it? What do I want players when they're leaving us to go away with? So, and, and because it's very transitory, uh, it being the college system and, and, and having players come in for a couple of years or, or young players who are now good enough. So, you know, Anya last year went to the States because she was good enough to go. She went to prep school and now has a D1 offer and going there next year. Um, her older sister is already there and has been for a few years. And her younger sister has one more year here with us before she'll also probably have that opportunity to go away. So. Um, and it's, it's trying to figure out, you know, what message do I want them to take with them when they leave? What will they say that this period of their basketball journey will have been? And I think that's important. You're asking, I always ask why, but you're asking the what and the whys are always important questions in every aspect of your life, but especially when you're a coach. I, yeah, I love that. Um, okay, so, you know, in relation to the upskilling, so what worked with me, what, what were the big changes from the first year to the second year? So um, probably the biggest thing was about honest communication. I, I, I'm a very positive coach. I'm not a screamer or a shouter. Um, I like to, to quietly reinforce the good things. Um, I, I do struggle at times with, with if I, you know, with criticizing somebody right there in the moment. I don't mean necessarily criticizing in a bad way. And even talking to you, you know, I struggle a bit with the terminology around that side of it. But, but what I try and do is phrase it in a such a way that they understand. But what I found out, you know, talking to the girls and, and getting them to open up a bit more with me was I was too positive. I was almost too nice about things. I was letting them get away with a bit too much in our conversations and not challenging them enough. Right. So, um, so that honest communication was big for me. You know, the title on this slide is Coaching Keys, and, and one of the things, that there's, a, there's an author over here, a guy who's involved in GEA, but he actually just wrote a book recently about, and it's one of the ones that I, I said to you, it's about coaching the individual in team sports. Um, his name is Philip Kerr, and I'd read his previous books on the GEA side of things, and he just poached, uh, just put up this book recently, actually, in the past month or so, but okay. he ties it all together and gives a lot of examples. Um, but his, his key was, you know, he said, coaching is a lot about having a, a bunch of different keys. And you have different keys that will unlock different things. And you've got to remember, there's no one key that does everything for you. So it's well, and I think, and, and here's somebody who's coached a long time. I think every kid has a different key. <laughs> um, I agree 100%. You know what I mean? It's like, that's, that's where I think I've grown as a coach, that I can think back to a team I had two or three years ago, and I knew that kid I could get on and wanted me to ride him. That kid I had to put my arm around. That kid I had to talk, talk to and correct the big stuff 
outside of practice. It's like, you know, all of them, we all are, I mean, there's a 8 billion individuals walking around the earth right now. So we're all a little different. I think we, I think that when you have coaching keys there, we all have a different key, um, which is, I think that's a great, I'm, I'm going to steal that coach. I love that. Okay, go ahead. Sorry. Yeah, yeah, no problems. Um, then next part was about me upping my game. So, you know, doing a bit more research, trying to figure out how I could look at the total season. And, and I've got a couple of PDFs I'll actually share with you now, kind of around periodization, where we looked at the total year and, and how, how I was going to do it at different stages and, and, you know, input that I was going to try and get from, from the university. Um, and then look, started looking at things like, you know, finding that balance of player input. So, empowering the players to do more during training so that then they were less reliant on me for play calling decision making during games and, and I was trying to do it in such a way because I think it's, it's it was easier for me to do it because I had a really good point guard so that girl has gone to gone on to division one she was my point guard she'd been on my Irish team she'd grown with me that way and and I'd had her for a few years and it's it's easy when you have a good point guard you know, to, to trust your point guard to go and do a job for you. But what I realized was it wasn't just the point guard that I needed to empower. You know, she was my floor general, yes, uh, but there was times when she wasn't out there. Um, you know, one of the things that I also kind of looked at was trying to balance my minutes a little bit better. So trying to get that balance between player development and providing opportunities and winning games. Right. So we probably have the, the best, you know, time – time played roster uh, in national league over uh, probably any division over the last couple of years. Do you think that helped come the end of the season? Uh, it didn't this year. Okay. Uh, explain why. Um, but it definitely did at, towards the end of year one going into year two. We, we'd only won three games in the league. And then we had a big win in our last league game over one of the top teams. Yeah. Um, and then there was an end of season uh, competition and we ended up having a big away win by two points over a team that had beaten us twice during the season. And then we came home and, and we actually won a trophy uh, by beating the top team in the league because uh, we managed to get them. We, got, we were lucky enough to get a home draw for the final. Okay. Um, and then that kicked us into the second year. So suddenly there was a bit of belief we'd actually won a competition, even though we only won five games the whole season. Right. Um, uh, but, you know, those last three games were crucial because they kind of saw off the season in a good way and moved right. us forward going into, into year two. So, um, uh, yeah. So, and then it was, you know, the other thing, and, and you've spoken about it there, is understanding individual circumstances. Like, there's kids that, like you said, you got to ride a little bit. There's kids that you got to put an arm around. Um, the big thing for me was, was, you know, trying to make myself more available so that if they want to talk about what was going on outside of basketball. Right. You know, you'll always have those conversations and hear bits and pieces, but it was actually listening as opposed to making yourself available. So they understood that I had an honest, uh, that you know, that I was honestly engaged in, in what they were telling me. And um, I would remember it and I would ask the question next time I saw it, you know, how did this go for you? Was everything all right around this? Or, you know, is, is your mom feeling better? Or whatever it might be. So, right. Um, and then going on. So... Um, I guess the things that didn't work, you know, where it was, I spoke earlier a little bit about shoehorning. So, you know, just trying to fit, fit players into my philosophy rather than adapt my philosophy around who I have. So, um, and then, like I said, that total positivity, which is an ongoing thing and it's going to be one I'm going to have to work on more and more. But, um, I do think I've upped my game over the last couple of years, even in, in and how do you do that? You as an individual? Yeah, well, I, I'm lucky enough the last couple of years I've had an assistant coach. Um, she's a very experienced coach, but, you know, she's she's a senior lecturer here at the university. But she's, uh, her daughters are actually the girls that were playing, and that's why she didn't want to be a head coach. And, okay. Um, but she wanted to be there for them. But at the same time, you know, uh, she was probably one of the reasons that I moved up here to Belfast originally. Right. Um, one of only a couple of female coaches that were coaching men's Super League at the time. Okay. And she's an ex-Irish international and an ex-Irish. Uh, she represented Ireland in athletics as well. Um, so I've, I've an awful lot of respect for her. Uh, and she, she was great at, you know, kind of helping me understand that, you know what, because she's a lecturer, she's a teacher, you know, she's 25 years, maybe 30 years doing that now. Right. Um, she, she understands that, you know, you just need to be able to tweak and change how you do it. So um, she always make the point that, you know, Patrick is, 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 
different to how I would coach. You know, he's much nicer than about these sort of things than I would be. So it's just about finding that balance. So that was part of it. Um, the I, I have found what I have found a way to kind of deal with those. What I didn't do is is journaling, um, and it, basically it's self reflection. You know, I usually take a couple minutes a day and do that. Um, and that seems to help. It makes me go like, Ooh, I'm do, I got to do, try to do this tomorrow. And it's just, you can do the same thing by just, you know, self-talking and walk, going for a walk. But sometimes I think that the journaling part, that's what I have found to be useful. Um, I don't remember who told me to do that. Some, but I'm sure some mentor along the way said you should journal Steve. And it seems to be working, but, um, it's hard. It's gotta be part of your routine for sure. Yeah. Yeah, it is something I, I, I did look at, but it, the issue for me was around routine. It was making it part of my routine. So yeah, I got to the stage of now making making those phone calls. So I'll sit in the car coming home from work, and I'll and I'll ring one of the guys and we'll talk about what happens, you know. And uh, that, I guess that kind of fills that same same input for me. It's an opportunity yeah. to talk things through, and bounce bounce it off people. So um, yeah, that's kind of that's kind of the big thing, and that's that's. Um, that's part of my growth as a coach, if you know what I mean. So we were talking about quotes, you know, and I know you said you want a quote for the end, but and this is particularly the active thing about Kobe, but the big thing for me here isn't about, you know, winning the games. And, and that's the part that I probably tweak when we, when we speak about it at the start of the season and we do our goal setting sessions and, and we're looking at what we want to get out of it. It's, it's about, you know, here he is, one of the best players who's ever played the game. And, it's the different parts that he looks at and recognizes that are integral for a team to move forward. So, and I just thought it was a great quote. Um, and it's one that I, I do use quite a bit when we start talking at the start of the season with the girls, particularly when I was working with the junior and underage teams. Do you want to read it off and then kind of explain why you picked it a little bit? So people sure. are listening. so yeah. 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 So the quote is I'll do whatever it takes to win games, whether it's sitting on a bench, holding a towel, handing a cup of water to a teammate or hitting a game winning shot. So, you know, for, for me, it was, you know, encompassing that bench player role. It was understanding that you needed to be there for your teammate as a supportive. And then, you know, taking ownership when you needed to and, and stepping up and, and taking that leadership and, and, and being that person who could hit that game winning shot, you know, put that time and effort into it. Um, and then it leads you into talking. And, you know, a lot more people now, particularly younger people, have a, have a better understanding of, who Kobe Bryant is, unfortunately, because he's passed away and there's been so much about him in the media. Right. But for, you know, for a lot of the younger ones, they might have only just seen a little bit of his tail end of his career and not had a full understanding of who this guy was and, and his work ethic. Um, and I think, it, you know, that's the big thing for me is it leads into, he's probably the prime example of work ethic. You know, he's, he was that guy who was there at four o'clock in the morning getting shots up. Uh, and then moving forward and not afraid to, to do what he needed to do to up his game. Right. Um, and, uh, yeah, so like, it's very sad that he's gone from us this year, but um, he, he has provided some real inspiration along the way. Um, and then, you know, there was two other things that, that kind of – so Pat Riley, who I like quite a lot, and I, I've read some of his stuff, um, and he says, you know, uh, excellence is – uh, the gradual result of always striving to do better. Um, and for me, you know, it, 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 it's never an easy flip a switch and suddenly we're great. It's about the process, not the outcome. And that's probably the thing I say nearly every training session. And it's what we talk about in our game plans. And uh, after we've done a scout report coming into the weekend, you know, this is what we want to do. If we do this, then we're going to be fine. But if we don't do this, then, then we're going to struggle. So I'm not worried about winning the game. I'm worried about us, you know, doing these three things. And if we do these three things to the level that we can, then we're going to win. Um, and then the other one, which, you know, which I would say a lot, probably more recently in the last two years after I probably spent a bit of time is challenge is not a threat. So if I'm challenging you to be better, if I'm challenging you to take that next step, you know, it's, it's not a, it's not a threat. Take it as, take it as, you know, take it as that, as that, red flag to a bull. I want to get better. I want to push through this. I want to come out the other side. So, right. Um, and then, you know, the idea, I just threw the other one in because I just, I'm a firm believer in the 10 things that require zero talent. And this is one of the things that we, when we talk at the start of the season and I ask players to put up their, you know, their, 
their charter for how the season is going to be and how their behavior is going to be. If these 10 things aren't up there, then this gets shown pretty quickly. Yeah, so read the 10 things and then I have a question on the 10 things for you. Yeah, okay. So being on time, uh, your work ethic, your effort, your body language, your energy, your attitude, your passion, being coachable, doing extra, and being prepared. So if you, so, let's say you could only pick three of those. What well, three would you pick? Uh, it would have to be, for me, it would be effort, uh, attitude, uh, and doing extra. Yeah. Okay. Those are great. Yeah. I don't, I, the, the list is so good that I think if you pick three, you're going to be good. Yeah. Being on time is one of mine, but that would not be in my top three, but it's literally one of my pet peeves. Yeah. <laughs> and the kids don't understand why. And I go, it's not about Mr. Coll Coach Collins being a jerk about being on time. It's not about that. It's about all the things that go with being on time. <laughs> you know, it's showing energy. It's showing the right attitude. It's being coachable. It's doing the extra thing. It's literally doing all those other things, you know, respecting your teammates time, all those things, you know? Um, yeah. yeah. So it's like, I always have to explain that one, especially for teenage boys. It's like, they don't never know why I'm such a stickler on being on time. And it's like, well, here's why, um, yeah. you know, you're on time you're late. Yeah. Well, yeah, it's, it's Lambo time. Did you ever know that lamb the the clock in Green Bay at, at, for the Green Bay Packers is ten? Curly Lambo, who coached it, was the first coach. The clock's wrong; it's fifteen minutes. So they, I always say Lambo time. If we were in Lambo time, which means you're fifteen minutes early. <laughs> um, yeah. So if I say seven, you're there at six forty-five. We we do everything on Lambo time, but yeah. <laughs> um, oh, I love that. Um. All right. Before I get on to this, talking about the three pillars, I, I want to jump off this screen if that's okay. Okay, yep. For talk sure. a little bit about the periodization. So, um, coach is really tech savvy. Sometimes I have to walk people through this. So, I really appreciate this, coach. <laughs> no problems at all. Um, okay, so one of the things, you know, I was talking there about upskilling and getting better and, and challenging myself um, and looking kind of at the organizational side of things. So, I did, a, I did a lot of research into, you know, what successful teams were like and when they started planning. And, and bearing in mind that I'm operating in an amateur sport um, where we don't have any paid professionals. Right. Uh, I had to kind of look at it and see what can I utilize around me and then kind of work out agreements with different departments in the university and, and, and different development officers and other coaches and strength conditioners and that sort of thing. So, um, so I, I kind of came up. With, with this, which suits our particular season. So our season, you know, starts in, in the end of September, start of October, and goes through until uh, April normally. So this was from a couple of seasons ago. Um, and we just kind of look at, at the different phases of the season. And then if you look down the left-hand side, I, you know, we talk a little bit about what competition. So for us, there's preseason league, and then we have a national cup competition, which is very important, which is run during the season. Um, then we look at the different phases, so in, in relation to, to how it fits into the overall season, um, what physical activities, so that's really around strength and conditioning, um, the mental side of things, so sports psychology, you know, what, what are the different things that I, I like to really focus on. So there's elements of that I'll do the whole time, but then there's particular areas I like to remind myself to focus on. Uh, the technical side, so you know, when we get on court, what we're working on, so our activation of fundamental skills, our base skills, and then we start to consolidate those skills in game scenarios, and then we move on to, when I talk about advanced skills, it's more about the tweaks that we have to make, because we're playing teams we've already played, so it's, it's those in-game adjustments or, or, you know, um, and different things we're looking at. And, you know, we brought in where we do four weeks testing, so we put the guys through uh, testing scenarios so that we can monitor how they're doing. I've been very lucky from a, from an injury point of view doing this and the way I kind of structure my warm ups and we have persistence going that we haven't had much until this year. Right. So this year I, I lost three girls in the last week of my season. Um, so, uh, and it was really, really tough. One girl did her ankle um, and then one had a game on the weekend and then the following Tuesday when we were training another girl, my, my backup point guard, she did her ankle and I was left with one guard going into, you know, a playoff situation and she did her ACL seven minutes into the first quarter. Oh. So, so let's go, the ACL thing, you can't really do anything. There's some, no. there's some, there's some things you can do the strength and other parts of their body about the ACLs, but girls yeah. tend to do their ACLs more 
studies have been done just because of the hips and the birthing connect all sorts of stuff anyway but there are ways that you can differentiate that the other two twisted their ankles so do they wear ankle braces they didn't neither of them and neither of them had ankle problems before okay uh, i've been blessed for the past two years i've only had one girl and, and she plays gaelic football and so all her injuries have come through gaelic football so i'll, I'll cool. send you some studies that have been done on ankle braces ankle braces yeah. are like um they're like uh, airbags in cars. They basically just slow the twist. Um, no one plays Division One men's basketball in the States without being taped or wearing braces. No one. No one. Zero. Like, we would have no issue with getting taped over here, but a lot of our medical knowledge is, is, is saying that you become too reliant with the ankle brace. Yep, there, yep. And I'd love to see the studies on that. I'd love to see the studies on that. Because I don't think they, they, they don't... It, this is the statistician in me. The studies show that it doesn't weaken the ankles. It actually, what it does is it makes a, um, it makes a twist, not five weeks or six weeks. It makes it like a week and a half. So, you know, you're not going through the windshield and in the hospital for six months in a car accident. That's why you have the seatbelt on. You bang your head and get a concussion. You're out for a week, you know, that kind of thing. I'm yeah. telling you, it, it's I, I preach it and it's like old school thing, but I, I'll send you the I'll send you the research on it. It's the braces are actually almost better in some respects because you can retighten them. Yeah. Um if you have like a little twist during practice and you gotta walk it off, you know, those little ones that sometimes happen. Then yeah. they can take their shoe off and they can retighten. A tape job actually loosens a little bit. Um and it's easier to just slip the braces on, and lace them back up and tighten them. But anyway. Uh, it's not an easy sell, trust me. Um, no, and, and, and a big part of us is, is we, our girls are they're looked after through the university, so our physiotherapy department at the university and that side of things. So I'm really lucky that we, excuse me, that I have that um, you know, resource here right. at the university. So a lot of the other clubs don't, and they might have to reach out and pay, or you know, they might get some young physiotherapists who are coming in and just starting, uh, just starting their working life and they're looking to do something for, for living. Is that a big major for some of the kids? It is, yeah, because it, 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 we're such a sporting nation, uh, you know, and it's all different types of sports that, that there's a lot of work out there on it. So, oh, I bet, uh, I bet there is. I bet there's. Yeah, all right, I'm, like, I'm, off my, I'm off my soapbox sorry. now. Go ahead. I'm sorry. <laughs> no Ankle braces. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, so so I I found this. I do it every year, and you know it, it just reminds me at the different stages of the season. I actually have reminders put into my calendar for the different weeks, um, to come back and check on this and see where we're at. It's great. It's great. I have one of these too, so I'll, mm -hmm. both of us will share ours. Kind of. I think young coaches don't map this kind of stuff out sometimes, and I love how you broke it up into player. You know, you broke it up into different levels. I love that with yeah, colors. Yeah. So we're working on it. Yeah. Yeah. So that was one. And then the other one that was really big for my game um, coaching was um, the different sets that we play. So in our conference, depending on how the season goes, the number of teams playing, but this particular year, um, we were playing in conference. So we'd play home or away against the teams in conference. And then we'd play either home or away against the teams out of conference. So there's two conferences, north and south. Right. Um, so for this, this was reminding me what we had done and played against certain teams and then what I was keeping, you know, in the back pocket or when I needed to start, you know, incorporating this into our training sessions. So um, across the top is the weeks and then also the teams that we were playing. Um, and then down the left-hand side were defensive sets, offensive sets, or baseline out-of-bounds and our sideline out-of-bounds. So, and this was just up until Christmas. So this was just to remind me the main things, you know, so like we, we play a lot of man to man. I don't, I don't play a lot of zone. I go to it every now and then to change things up, but predominantly I, I play a lot of man. Right. And, and then it was just, you know, the different types of presses that we'll put on. Um, uh, and then looking at our offensive sets, it was, you know, our, our motion. We had two or three different types of motion sets that we would always go into. How long do you give them off during winter break? Say that again, sorry. How long do they get off during Christmas break? Oh, so it, it, for the men, it was a week. For the girls, it was two. Okay. So then we might we might play our last game on on the fifteenth of December, and then we had two games on the fourth and fifth of January. So do the do do the U.S. girls go home? Sometimes yes. Uh, sometimes they just go to Europe and spend a few days in Europe, and family comes over to meet them. Um, that'd be, but, that'd be good. 
That'd be good. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Yeah. 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 I, what I found is um, we don't actually, I, I don't like them to go for too long because it's difficult for them to train when they're at home. Uh, they're in a bit of a, you know, a catch up mode with all their friends and family. And then when they're back to me, I got to work them really hard for a week and yeah. normally them for like two training sessions before our games that fall. Right. Yeah. I can see that. Um, yeah. So there's a bit of that. Some clubs don't let their Americans go home at all. Um, they say you got to stay, you know, you're working Christmas camps or whatever the case might be and right. job for the year. So, so. Hey coach, welcome. So glad you found us on YouTube. Let me know how I can help. Um, as you can see, I've won lots of championships. I've won, I've won my, my fair share of, of, of balls behind, you know, run one of the best high school programs in the country, coached a bunch of NBA guys. Let me help you become a better basketball coach. This, this video is just one small piece. Let me mentor you, teachhoops.com. Click down below or above. We'll help you do that. It is the one stop shopping for basketball coaches, but the best part is you get a Yoda, you get a mentor, I will help you. You'll get my personal email address. You will get one-on-one -on -one calls, office hours, you name it. We will help you become a better basketball coach. Enjoy. Yeah, <laughs> I can see that. Yeah, so, and, and yeah, we're, we're slightly different. There is there is that little bit of leeway, you know, to be, to be decided and work out with the students. But a lot of the times they'll come to me and say, look, you know, I'd like to take four days here and go, and that's fine because we don't have training because the university's closed. Right. And then they're back and they're saying, you know, I'm going to take one day. So they might end up missing one training session that I have scheduled over a period of time. So, um, But again, this is just something that I found helpful to remember what I did against certain teams and then, what I was keeping in the locker as we, as we got to move right. on. So it's the, the stuff you're explaining is actually like pre pre practice planning. Like you're, you're, pre yeah. you're, you're mapping out the year and then you're mapping out what you're going to need in for specific things. So I'm guessing when you're doing your practice plan, at least you have this one by you kind of. Yes. Yeah. yeah. And it guides me. So, and the yeah. certain how we can change. So if we play a team, you know, our first game of the league and after we've played them, cause we, we won't have been able to scout them coming up to that really unless we were lucky enough to see them in a preseason tournament. Right. Um, so then after that game, we'll break it down and we'll decide, all right, actually, you know what? Next time when we play them, we're going to do this, this, and this because they're really not going to have, have issues with it or we're going to change our defense this, this way because of what they're looking to rely on. So okay. it, it's, it's a working document. It's, it's for me, you know, I'll put it out there and I'll have an idea based on who is coming back from the other teams that I can find out. And then, and then we tweak and change it as we kind of go. But normally by, by October, I have it pretty much locked in because by then I have seen all the other teams in the league watch their game tape, even if we haven't played them yet. So, okay. Um, and then, because I know you love session plans, so. I do. Is a typical. Session plans, he calls them session plans. I love that. Yes. Yeah, so. Um, lesson plan, yep. Yeah, exactly. So, or practice plan, whatever you want to go with. Yep. Um, so for me, this is one that we, you know, we did last year in September. Um, so the goals for the training were to, to continue embedding our key principles through gameplay. And this particular stage of the season, you know, we did a lot. Of, I do a lot of stuff with ball in hand. Um, there's probably one drill in there where there's no, there's no defense or they're not having to react and make a decision. So, and that's the very first drill that we do. I call it Liberty. It's, it's one where you have two lines under the basket and you're literally catching, finishing high and you just work in an almost uh, circular motion, joining one line after you shoot and going on to the next one. So, and we work and just shoot uh, at the basket, at the block and at the elbow, uh, and then from the free throw line. It takes about four minutes. We work as a team to, to a goal. We call it out. It's a good one to start our communication and get going. And you know, there's a few catchphrases that we put in there and just to remind the girls, catch high, finish high, particularly when we're close to the basket. You know, Don't bring the ball down. You know, give yourself that opportunity to get the shot off quickly. Um, we will then do closeouts, but we'll do them where we're until we do our ramp, which is our, our uh, exercise warm up. Um, we don't, I don't allow contact, so I won't, I won't let them go one on one. I won't let them do any of that sort of stuff. Okay. Because you know I, that was the research that I did a few years ago with the national team and, and the advice that I got from the experts we were dealing with, and uh, you know we've been lucky enough that we, you know until this year we've had no injuries. Right. Not to speak of. Part of it, I think, is this. Then we'll do a ramp, and that's just, uh, you know, it is um, uh, 
sorry, it is uh, moving stretching. I can't even think of words. Not static stretching, dynamic stretching. There we go. Dynamic stretching. There you go. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Stretching exercises. Yeah. So and it's a set one that we do. Um, and the last minute is if there's anything specific the girls want to work on. So okay. um, I, I'm of the opinion that, you know, it, it's just purely about activation. So it's just about, to act, you know, to activate those muscles for certain things. So like they'll jump, they'll skip. Uh, they'll come down off two feet um, they'll you know change a direction so that's all incorporated into that and it, and it just takes a couple of minutes to do but it just gets them ready to go and then we'll go back into our close up play but we'll end up playing three man or four man um, but now we'll focus on on one, you know one of the things that we do we play a lot of, of ball screen offense okay. and it's a lot of ball screen offense so big focus on my sessions are around how we deal with do you spend so you you run a ball screen offense do you do you work spend a lot of time defensively on how to deal with ball screens and do you yeah. see a lot of ball screens in your league yeah we do not not as much this year from the top team okay they were mostly of guards and and they just you know they ran a lot of motion stuff without, okay. without a ball screen but a lot of the other teams which who had post players ran ball screen stuff so um so we would focus on you know what i call jamming so where we jam under uh yeah. The, you know, particularly they're not great shooters, so we'll identify in our scout and go under. Do you, do you have a glossary? Of, do you have a glossary of like? So you're talking about jam. We talk about. He I mean, everyone's got a little bit of different terminology. Do you? Do you have? Does does the the national organization have terminology, or do you have terminology within your club that you use? Yeah, so I I, I have my own terminology. It is pretty pretty similar to what would be used here by a lot of the coaches okay. so so for us you know it, it's there's jam um there's switch uh there's hedge we go soft hedge or hard hedge depending yep. on okay. how hard you want yep. to push them uh, we'll ice uh, which i think is is pretty much the same as as what you would understand icing to me where we'll come off the screener and try and isolate the ball handler uh force them into into staying on the side yeah uh, and then the one that I brought in this year is, is one that I've kind of seen some of the EuroLeague teams use, and it's called tagging. And that's where we run a, a we'll run a, a weak side guard or post in to take the, the rolling uh, screener. Okay. We'll actually, and then we'll run our, our guard who was guarding up high, we'll sprint to cover the corner. So it's anytime we're in a strong side corner situation. We work three man off off. You our use a lot of that terminology. It's it's yeah. I mean, I think that's the key is as long as you're using consistent terminology. Yeah. Like we, yeah. When we switch, we talk about talk, touch, take, talk, touch, take. You know, yeah. um, you know, you're gonna talk through it. You're gonna touch the guy, and then you're gonna take him. You know, those little things that as long as you you got the term like you could ask an eighth grader that would coming to me, they know what talk, touch, take is. Um, yeah. but it's terminology. It's all that stuff. I think that glossary is super important, but it sounds like you do that. Um, yeah, I'm sorry. Go ahead. Keep going. I no, love no, no, that is it. So, um, you know, that, that's normally about 20 minutes. Okay. Water break, um, and free throws. So there are certain times, uh, on training sessions when I'll do specific free throw shooting and put pressure on players. But a lot of times we just want to get reps up and, and get them so that in a week they'll shoot, you know, somewhere between 70 and 80 free throws. Okay. Just as part of their session when they're in and doing it. And, and we as a team shot 77% last year. And Ooh, that's good. Within, yeah. yeah, there was nobody within 9% of us. Um, it's, it's been that way for the last two years. You can you can win games by shooting free throws, trust me. Oh, yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, <laughs> and then the other thing around that is is it's time for the girls to talk and do a little bit of peer coaching. So right. the things that I bring in around that kind of – I have WB written there, which is water break. So okay. then – got to go shoot free throws and then they'll have a talk about thing and, and at the start of the session i didn't say this actually but we'll at the very start what we'll do is we'll talk about right what are the goals for the session today so these are four things that we want to come out of it so do you meet them before in do you have a pre-practice do you meet them before you go to the court do you how does that work yeah so about, about five minutes before we can get onto the court because uh, court time is limited so we have our slot between you know eight and ten so I'll meet the girls uh, outside the, the door to the court and we'll talk briefly just about, right, this is what we're focused on for tonight. This is what okay. we're looking to get done. Um, and then they'll, they'll already have started to lace up their boots and stuff while they're outside so that when we get in, we can hit the ground pretty well. How do you feel, how do you feel about your transition between drills? Uh, it, it works because I, what I try and do is I do it in segments. So okay. 
the biggest thing for me is is I I used to get caught uh, trying to explain it there and then, and I could be ten or fifteen minutes going through it over and over again, and then I'd come back the next session and think, yeah, you know what, they're going to know it. We spent four minutes on just this alone, and you know they're making the same mistake. So now what I try and do is is I synopsize down to like the three key words or whatever it might be for each of those or the actions that we're looking to do, and then from that. What we'll do then is is we'll just break it down. So okay. we'll go into it. Here we are. We're only going to spend four minutes on it or reach this goal, and and this is it. And if you've got a question, we'll talk about it during our water break reflection time. Okay. So that's two or three perfect. minutes in in the segment. I try not to interrupt in between unless something has gone really badly wrong, or okay. you know, I haven't explained things something right, and and we're just not picking up on it. So, um. This particular section, then we, you know, we do we try and do an individual skill development part, but it's always one on one. So, you know, for here we just talked about uh, post and uh, wing series. So we just worked on finishes, catching finishes, looking on focusing on our footwork, feeding the D. We have three different types of finishes that you know I would try and emphasize depending on whether we catch on the block, below the block, or, or above the block. Um, and then we'll do a little bit on ball screen reads where we work in pairs. Um, so we'll have two coming up, and we just work your top of the key so like a horn situation or we'll work uh side ball screen and okay. we we'll talk about our, our different reads and what we're going to do out of it so um, that feeds into a lot of what we do when we're in our 3v3 4v4 as we start to build up so um then this particular session we did a lot on rebounding you know uh, rebounding i think is i always say it's the fifth skill in basketball and you know if you actually talk about teams how much time they spend doing rebounding yeah, it's as frustrating as how much time they spend doing free throws. Yeah. I, I, uh, throws your team I don't know. Have you been watching Last Dance with uh, Michael Jordan? Uh, I don't have Netflix, so I'm saving it up. And what I'll do is I'll get somebody's account and then binge on the 10 episodes. 10 episodes. Okay. So so um, the last one last week was on um, Rodman. And, yeah. and, and, you know, everyone knows he's probably one of the best rebounders ever. But what, what I found intriguing, and he said this in the last dance, and it, it pertains to what you're talking about in rebounding, he would have friends go to the gym when he was in the NBA and just shoot and he for hours, and he would just rebound their shots. <laughs> like, because he and wanted... He standing on the flout of the ball. Of the ball. He, he wanted to know the flight of the ball. And, and, when, and when you watch it, it will be crazy. He'll say, well, here's how Larry Bird's shot went. And he knew that it had a lot of spin, so the way it would go, because he had seen so much of it, or... Yeah this shot da, da, da. and it was like he was like that he knew that's how he was going to play and be on the court and be Dennis Rodman but it was just intriguing that he picked that one skill and he became an artisan of that skill like I'm gonna just learn how the ball is gonna bounce when it hits the rim every time yeah. um so it's very intriguing so when you watch it you'll see what I'm talking about but anybody that's watched it will know what I'm 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 talking about but that's a nuance that I don't think people I mean, he spent hours like Michael Jordan's probably spent hours on his floater. You know, yeah. he spent it on reading the ball on a missed shot. It's crazy. Anyway, go ahead. Yeah, people don't spend time on rebound at all. No, and and like you know, percentage wise, it it's all about that second possession game for teams and denying it to the other team and, and trying to cut down the possessions. Um, and then the other thing for me really is is trying to work the percentages of where shots are likely to go. Right. So, you know, a lot of teams will shoot threes, you know, so like sometimes some of the teams up to a third of their shots will be threes. So it's understanding, all right, where if it's a corner three, where's the most likely place that it's going to go for the rebound. So we'll, we'll talk about that a lot. Um, there's one drill in particular there, which I didn't actually do up for you, but I will um, okay. but I can explain it pretty easily. Uh, we'll have four players outside, two in the corner, two on the wings, sometimes five, but normally four. Um, and then we'll work. Uh, four defensive players, one in each block and one in each elbow. And those four players uh, defensively will start to circle around. But as they're doing that, they're pointing at the player offensively they're closest to and calling it out so their team knows. I have the ball or coach has the ball or, you know, or one of the players has the ball. And then on my shout, they'll shoot or I'll shoot. And then the players have to go box out. And then it's a defensive versus offensive to try and regain okay. possession. Um, it was actually one that I saw um, Lynn Mulligan, the Ryder Division One women's coach, do. And actually, one of her girls came to a, came to us this past year. She was our point guard. Um, but I had seen her. She'd come over and done a clinic uh, a couple of years ago, and this was one of the drills she demonstrated in her clinic. And I just thought it was really good because it 
it focuses on movement, having to adjust, communication, letting your team know, uh, and then starting to understand that, you know, when players crash from the corner, when players, players crash from the wing or players crash from the top, you know, there's different things that you have to do. And we start breaking down a little bit then about, you know, how do you T-bar them? You know, do you need to go all the way out to them? Do you meet them? You know, what you're trying to do is force change of direction, force them to stop and move, that kind of thing. So, okay. uh, yeah, it's, it's, it's a real good one. I, I found that the girls embrace it quite a lot. And, and we had a lot of, you know, even offensively, the girls are learning how to read defenders trying to box them out. And it, it just gives them that opportunity. I, I, and I've said this on podcasts before, but an offensive rebound is a selfish thing. Like, I tell my guys, if you get an offensive rebound, then that's your ball at that point. Because yeah. we're getting an extra shot. I go, you don't have to pass it back out. If you have a shot, I mean, that's yours. Like, you just went earn that. Go, You can do it. I mean, so, yeah, there's a nuance to that, too. Um, there is. Yeah. When we're shooting well, I'd say, you know, your first option is go back up. Your second option is kick it out. And if you're open, you can let it go. Because you know what? We've just got one offensive rebound. We're in a good spot. We're yeah, we're at, a, we're at a plus, like the plus minus system. We're at a plus at this point because we're getting two shots. Um, mm -hmm. I had a friend who coached, uh, who was coaching like seven-year-old girls. And his philosophy was just throw the ball up as much as he can. Because, you know, the law of large numbers, it's the same with that. The more offensive rebounds you get, the more shots you're going to get at the basket, you're probably going to win more often, you know? Yeah, um, yeah, absolutely. So, um, yeah, we, we were – our sweet spot was about 80, 82 possessions per game. But Ooh, that's we, good. We were a bit hectic. But we were averaging – this past season, we averaged 79 points. The year before, we averaged 82. You play what, quarters? Uh, four quarters, 10 minutes each. 10 minutes each, okay. Yeah. So, yeah, we're, you know, it, it's pretty high scoring for, for women's basketball. But yeah. that's the level our league is at at the moment. You know, we've got some good, good players playing in it and, and we can get the, get the ball up and down the court pretty well. Uh, moving on after that, then we'll kind of do a lot of uh, small sided games. So, a lot of 3v3, a lot of 4v4v4, um, putting that pressure on, started working their conditioning a little bit more and understanding and strong side action and where you're supposed to be on weak side action. Again, a lot of ball screen stuff in this particular session. Put some constraints in as and when we need to. Um, working on defending against cutters. Uh, you know, if there's a screen away, you know, what are the reads coming off it, where we need to be on help rotations, that side of stuff. And, um, then this particular session, I finished up with a transition drill, which I like, which I actually had for you um, as one of the ones that I want to share. It's 3v2 continuous. Um, so it's all about decision making for me. And, you know, there's, there's a couple of little rules that I'll put in there, but there are more guidelines than rules. And okay. Um, then it's about getting, getting teams to go and I'll kind of go to that. Then we'll do our cool down, circle stretch and review, and let the players talk about what went well, what didn't go well. Um, so after this one, the players felt good after warm up. It's always something I check to make sure that they're ready to go. Um, and then they identified the need to talk more on, on ball screen D and let each other know a little bit, a little bit earlier when stuff was coming. And then we do a coach's review. So for me and my assistant coach, you know, so. Here, just, you know, a couple of the girls were slow to start. Uh, NTTB need to touch base. So need to reach out to them after training and make sure they're okay. There's nothing else going on. Uh, right. And then the positive side box. I up. love that. And a couple of coaches that I've been talking to about practice, it's like you always want to be checking in with all your players, but you know how hectic it gets. So I love yeah. that aspect of put them on the practice plan. You know, like just a, a quick check-in. Like, how you doing? How's school going? You know? Um, yeah, I love that. I love that because we all get caught up in our day to day lives and our practice pre planning, and yeah, yeah, it works for me. Um, okay, do you want to move on to the drill? Yeah, let's move. Let's talk about that one. I love that. All right, so, um, there's a series of what we call 11 man drills. So, when you're given an advantage to offense, and and there's lots of different ones, this is one that I particularly like. So, um, it's 3v2 continuous. Yep. So the way we start, uh, we, we, there's a few different ways you can start. You can start from free throw. You can start from strong side action, so off a ball screen, um, or a coach call at halfway. So sometimes we can have a fun game getting into it, and we might do that early in the season when, when we're just working on the girls getting up and down and starting to make reads. Um, this particular one starts from a free throw. Once the free throw goes up, any of the five players can go and get it. Normally it's the four players that are in. Right. Um, and so there's no offense or defense. Everybody's hustling and going after it. Um, I like that start, yeah. Then we'll outlet to the, the free throw line extended. There's two girls waiting on either side, one girl on each side. So now it'll be those three players coming down. 
we put a lot of pressure on whoever gets the rebound to try and deny that pass. Uh, you know, in this particular situation, number one who took the free throw might try and cheat over after she knows she's not getting the rebound to try and steal the pass. And if she steals it, then she can go with the other two players. So it's about getting those reps. And, and we pride ourselves on, on trying to get those interceptions because it just makes us more hungry. Um, and it's something that, you know, I, I had built into it before. It used to be a bit, a bit stagnant. You know, if you get that rebound, then there's no pressure on you. You make that pass and you're running down the other end. Now we keep that pressure levels up force them to have to make decisions, you know, we try not put the ball on the ground or if we do only for a dribble or two. So if we move on to frame three, then we, we try, I, I call the lane, so that middle lane from, from right down the middle of the court and I'm all about crossing the lane. I, I always talk to my players, if defense is set up in a certain side, then we try and cross the lane to force them to move and then we try and take advantage coming in on the other side. So now it becomes a 3v2 drill coming down the other side. Um, so in this situation, uh, X5, which doesn't actually mean our center, it was just that girl that was particularly there. So she's right. across the lane, try and get over, because X1, if she didn't receive the ball, she, the odds are she's going to be first one down the court. So that's going to establish our strong side, bringing the ball over to that side, and now we're going to try and force the defense to adapt to it. Um, speak a lot about getting to the elbow and keeping your dribble, not giving the ball up too early forcing the defenders to have to make a choice, particularly the back defender, because you have to stay on the ball. Once you give it up, then, you know, the number two there, the defender could suck back in, and now it suddenly becomes a two-on-two -two with a shooter up top, and you take those percentages a lot of times. Whereas if you keep the dribble, you keep it live, now you force that defender to stay with you, and you're dictating to the defense rather than let them adjust to what you're doing. Um, so yeah, so we'll try and tack that strong side elbow. The shots we're looking for out of this is we're looking for wide open layups um, or uncontested jump shots because we force the defense to have to react to a ball fake or protect the basket, that side of things. Um, and then once that shot goes up, any one of those five players are fighting for the rebound and then they release and come down the other side. So um, I just added down here, you know, after that shot goes up and they come out, sometimes you might get it to a post or a center who isn't that comfortable with the ball. So then the opposite, uh, your opposite offensive player will cut into the middle and they'll take it and, and move it if, if it's a guard. So we, we'll throw different adjustments. We might say, you know, you've only got two dribbles. You've got to release the ball before the half court so that we're forcing the defense to adjust into it. Sometimes we put a third defender in the, in the, in the back court and they're forcing us to take over the halfway. So we still have an advantage situation once we get out of the court, but they're forcing us to have to think and be more careful with our reads. So it kind of depends on how well the girls are doing off it. So, um, and we'll run it for a period of time. So we'll, we'll go for, for maybe eight or 10 minutes, or I'll say, you know, five good baskets. And then, so five good baskets is either contested or a wide open jump shot that we knock down. So do you do that with most of your drills, like have a goal or something you're trying to do? Yeah, yeah, almost all of them. So, um, Sometimes, you know, sometimes it is time and early in the season, it might be that way when we're just trying to get more into the rhythm of what the drill is looking to get us out of. But then once we're input, uh, I'm pushing hard for, our, for us to have targets. So I think girls respond more. It's their thing. It's, it's one of the things that they, they constantly come back with is that they enjoy having, you know, it brings that competitive element. It brings those you know, one of the feedback we did our review sessions this past two weeks, and one of the things was, can we have a whiteboard continuously on the side of the court so we can keep track of numbers on different things? So, oh, I like that. Yeah, yeah. Uh, the players can run over and keep track of it themselves. You know, or the players right. are, are, yeah, are getting their water or whatever on the side before they step in. So, how do you deal with water breaks during practice? Um, so I have set ones uh, after segments, but you can grab water anytime you're on the sideline, you know, if you're waiting to step in or you're waiting to move on. So. And do you have like a, a bucket of water or do you have individual water bottles? Everybody's got their own bottle, no sharing. Yeah. I know. I'm telling you, I did that about 20 years ago. It's the best thing I ever did, especially with COVID-19. Now I'm looking smart, you know, <laughs> you don't want to make I hate, yeah, don't share that, that. I will actually get upset if they start sharing water bottles. I know it's like, yeah, yeah, it was the same. So uh, yeah, big thing for me was making sure they got big enough water bottles. Cause it drives me nuts when they go, Hey coach, can I go out and fill my water bottle? And then they're like, all right, that's a liter water bottle. So either you've drunk a whole lot of water or you didn't come in with it. 
So you didn't fill it. Yes, that's your responsive. That's the uh, that goes back to those ten things that don't require talent. Yes, you can do yeah. that. <laughs> um, all right. Anything else with the practice planning? Uh, no, that was that was kind of it. You know, if, if we go back to look at it, so I, I kind of break them into twenty minute segments. Segments so works out. Yeah. Yeah. So if you could only do three things at practice, what would you do? Like three things, like out of all the stuff you do all year, you can only do three things. <laughs> Right. For me, it's, it's ball screen. Okay. Transition. Uh, so we work hard in our transition to get up and down, and get those. And for me, it would be uh, rebounding, but next season, like I, I got to figure out more defense into that. Uh, into that. Okay. And yeah. when do you practice plan? When do you make this out? Like, I'm not talking about the, the other two screens we were talking about with yeah. the season. So, so this, this, so we train normally Tuesday, Thursday, and we might have a shoot around on Friday if we've got a game Saturday or Sunday. Okay. So I will do this uh, normally on a Sunday for the Tuesday, and then I will do this either Tuesday night or Wednesday for the Thursday because what we achieved and what we were good at will inform what I'm going to do in the next session, also keeping in mind the bits that I want to kind of get. So if you do it on Sunday, do you ever tweak on Monday? Uh, yes, especially if I haven't watched the tape. Right. <laughs> if you're, if you're so, doing more. Yeah, I get that. Okay. I always intrigued when people do it. Like I'm, I may, I may come home, eat dinner, chill. Everyone goes to bed and then think about it for the next day. Um, I need time to process like, Ooh, that didn't go well. And we film our practices. So I'm, I'm blessed that I can watch. If it's like, Ooh, we didn't do that. Yes. I need to work on that. But um, I love that. I love just knowing when everyone kind of does it and, and those kind of things. Um, did you have anything else with the PowerPoint you wanted to talk about? There was only one other thing. So yeah, so it was just about kind of the values, attitudes, and goals. Okay. When we start our season, you know, we, we talk a lot and I try and get the, the players to define these as much as possible with a little bit of guidance from me. So around the values, the standards of behavior, you know, your judgment of what's important in life, what's important while you're part of our program, when you're here with us, when you're not with us, the way you represent. And the attitudes, the way that you think and feel about something. So like I, I'll put these up on, on white, uh, whiteboard sheets and, and we'll just uh, flip church. And we'll just have the girls fill in in small groups at the start of the season what they want to get out of it. And then the goals, you know, we, we have or season goals, what we're looking to get done. And then we start working on personal goals with the girls as well. So um, kind of feeds into the, the review. When I do a review with a player, you know, the, or postseason review. So I get the girls to kind of talk about how their season went, what went well for them, what they didn't enjoy, what they, you know, they felt themselves, they got to work on. So a lot of self-reflection there. Um, I'll give my opinion on those things. Um, I also ask them for feedback about how they found the training sessions, how they found the games, how they found me as a coach in, in dealing with them. Um, and then we'll talk about, you know, these are the, the seven or eight things that we're going to incorporate into your workouts, your strength and conditioning, whatever it might be for your off season. And then we talk about next season. So, you know, like next season, this is the role that I can see you stepping into if you can do this work during the summer and get to where we think you can. Right. So you're basically, I mean, yeah, I, I do that. I mean, I think that's awesome for, for breaking it down because you're, you're self-reflecting with them. Um, and then I, I've, i that's probably when I learned the most about the season, which is sad too. Cause I, yeah. I, I do a mid season one that I have found successful. Um, around Christmas. Oh, yeah. Around Christmas. Might be a little bit later. Yeah. Yeah. Around Christmas. It's around Christmas. Um, usually it's Christmas break is when I have time to sit down and I go through and do, this is what I do. Cause you don't, I don't really know everyone's roles and I know their goals, but I don't know their roles when the season starts cause roles change. Um, so I wait till about the halfway mark of our season, which is about December, January, but at, over Christmas is when I start working on it. And what I do is I take every player, I have them give me input and then I go through and I say, I think this is, this is what I see your role being. And then I print it out and hand it out to everybody. And then we have individual meetings. So I want everyone to know everyone's roles. Um, so it's a process of sitting down with them, coming up together, talking about it and then sharing it with everybody you know, what's Johnny's role, everybody kind of knows it. So then yeah. that goes back to the self coaching I was talking about before. Yeah. When Johnny's not doing that, then you know, Sam's gonna say something to John, that's not your role. Remember, blah, 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 yeah. it's in the locker, blah, blah, <laughs> blah. Um, so it's an interesting concept that I've always tweaked it because I always thought those exit things and the things at the end of the season were so good. 
that I yeah. wanted input before before that um, yeah. to kind of like process during the season. And it's so hard to do it during the season. It really is. It is. Uh, now, those check-ins that we do and we put on a practice plan do help from that point of view. Yeah. Of yeah. Where players are at. I'm going to add that, the, too. The I love bigger, that. Yeah, maybe not the bigger uh, the bigger picture stuff, but the, the smaller picture day to day. What's going on for you this week? It does definitely help. So I love that. All right, so I'm gonna I'm gonna throw some rapid fires. What uh, What's your favorite Over. brand of basketball? Like type of basketball oh. you use during a game? Molten. Molten. Do you like the feel of the molten? I do, and and the extra lines just nicer for shooting. Okay. Um. Does everybody use a molten? Yeah, we do over here. We're, we're, they're our sponsor. They're also FIBA. So um, they sponsor the leagues over here. So Okay. Um, yep. I didn't know if anybody used anything else. Uh, one word to describe your ideal player. Smart. Uh, one sporting event in the world. What would you go to? Uh, it's got to be the Olympics, especially with 3v3 coming into it. That will be interesting. Oh. Yeah. I'm a massive believer in 3v3. Oh, it is, it is like, no, until you're like in seventh or eighth grade, you should not be playing anything other than three on three. And it's a different skill set, but it, the skill set complements five by five. The game, the, well, first of all, the, game of, basketball is, the game of basketball is not five on five. No. If you watch it, it's two on two and three on three. <laughs> That's all, you know. Except for, at times, division one level. Because I look at it and they're saying they're very role orientated, unless, you know, a lot of yeah. it. And then you're kind of going, uh, you know, you're missing something because you're not getting these opportunities. Yeah, you're missing all the. It's going to be interesting with the Olympics. I feel, um, you know, these Olympians can't even do their trainings. Like it's. Yeah. Um, well, it's pushed out to next year. We've it been, is. We've been getting some good news here actually just last night. So we've been given a, a phased uh, plan so long as certain tick marks are hit. So we, we think we could be back. Uh, whatever normal will be but come in late august mid august late august and so. will you let people come in and out that's the question yeah we're not we're not 100 percent on that I, I would imagine it'll probably be country by country basis just the same as there'll be warnings if there's certain countries that have a lot of a lot of cases still and then that'll be side of it and that's what has to that's what worry you about the u.s people yeah and and you know to be honest i'm looking at other options in case Americans aren't able to come in for this season. So. Right, yeah, that, it's going to be... In Europe yeah. and stuff like that. So. Right, because I think that might be an easier twist. Um, what's your favorite pregame meal? Uh, oh, pre-game meal? Um, no one said the typical Irish one from the U.S. that we think you eat, you know. Oh, what's that? Spuds and cabbage, bacon and Yes, cabbage. yes. <laughs> you wouldn't have that prior to a game. Uh, like my favorite <laughs> meal is my mother's cottage pie, so it's like minced beef with vegetables and then you've got uh, i prefer sweet potato topping so sweet potato mash on top Ooh, that sounds really good oh yeah it's gorgeous um but my my go-to meal probably before training and stuff uh, is i'll just make some tacos tacos pot pie they call it well midwest thing is they call them pot pies they make them in a big right. pot and it's a very similar um uh one skill not being taught in today's game probably the mid-range it is. And you know what I think? I think the next, if you, first of all, if you, again, when you watch Last Dance, Michael and Rodman had unbelievable mid games. And they also used a bank shot a lot, yeah. which is a skill that's, I don't know why it's lost. Like Michael would be airborne like this. And then it's like, oh, I'll just throw it off the board. It's like, he was so good at it. Um, but I think there's going to be a shift back to that mid range because I think defenses are coming to the point of taking layups and threes away. <laughs> Unless they extend the three point line even further. Yes. Well, my issue, at least on the guy's side is the court's not wide enough. Yeah. yeah I agree. It's literally not wide. The bodies we, are too. We, <laughs> yeah. We play FIBA regulations here. So we're, we're bigger than your college, your high school. We're not as big as NBA, but we're, we are bigger. So it does, you know, for the you're line, longer, you're longer. Yeah, yeah, but you're not wider. No, uh, but our three point line is is further up. So. Yeah, yeah, but the problem is, you look at the NBA. That corner is like twisted. I mean, yeah. that's why I think they got to make. I don't know. I think the NBA should be the first move to make it just ten, five feet wider on each side, just to give them more space. Because um, yeah. they're so. Facilities. That's going to be a problem. Huh? 
facilities like over here we're, we're so tight oh no i i i i'm, I'm not saying i i would say it would be like a hundred year move like you know every time someone builds something new they have to widen the court um yeah because it's not it's not reasonable but the bodies are yeah even at our level we we play 84 feet so the the court is shorter but it's not wide enough even for you know the guys that i'm coaching that are like d1 basketball players um uh one thing you do to relax what do i do to relax i love going to the movies so okay it's big for me yeah it's just nice go watch some mindless entertainment and switch off for you know a few hours that's why you gotta get netflix coach oh i got amazon prime and i got okay. the i'm okay for the moment okay <laughs> uh one coaching te technique you think's important empathy yeah amen i'm gonna snap on that one uh best player of all time for me it's jordan best player you have seen in person oh well, I, I saw jordan i saw my aunt lives in chicago i saw him play uh, just before he retired um and i met him when he was over here coaching or playing golf a couple of years after that wow yeah He's tall, isn't he? It's surprisingly tall. Oh, Lex, yeah. You know, for, for somebody who's a guard, you know, that 6'6 six, six is comfortable 6'6. Six, six, so. Yeah. It's, um. Oh, yeah. Uh, can, can I just make one point? Yes. And American colleges, please stop inflating the height of all your players. <laughs> it's to the stage now where, you know, it's a joke over here when they come over and go, oh, man, they shrunk on the plane. Right. Oh, yeah. I'm sure. Like, <laughs> so I do, well, I do one of two things on the roster. So I'll, mm -hmm. I'll give you a tidbit for the young coaches. So when I do my roster and I send it out, I do one of two things. I either make us taller by about two inches or I shrink us. Like, so if a kid's six foot, he's either going to be six, two, or he's going to be five. Ten. Yeah. So they're going to, the coach is going to, if, if you haven't really scouted me, you really won't know. And you'll go, yeah. man, they're tiny. And then all of a sudden they'll walk on the court and it's like, or the other way, we're really short, and then they think we're taller than we are. But, yeah, you're right. Yeah. Uh, I, I ring and I ask. Yeah, I ring and I ask. You know, so we've had, a, we've had scholars now for the last, you know, six, seven years. So I'll ring and say, right, do you know this person that played in your conference? Or and now they might be back there and they might be assistant coaching over there. And I'll say, right, is that a legit 6'6"? Six, six? Right. Or, you know, the inflated 6'6", six, six, you know? Right. So, are they 6'4"? Are they yeah. yeah. So yeah. it's a big difference over here, particularly in the men's game. Oh, in the men's team, I'm guessing you want bigger guys to come over. Almost all teams do, yeah, because we have a lot of good guards, and, and there are a few teams then that will have size, uh, whether it be European or they just got big, some big Irish kids. Um, but, yeah, almost all teams are, are looking for size. You know, our tallest guy last year was 6'4", so we, and that was actual 6'4". So. So what do you think the strongest aspect for the guy, on the guy's side and the girl's side um, what's the strongest skill set they have? Uh, they need to be, you know, I would, not always, but I would probably take a really good D3 player over a mid-major D1. Almost 90% of the time, because the D3 kid will have done a bit of everything. And so long as he's a scorer, which is, you know, what we bring them in here to do, um, it, it, you know, the, we've, we've worked, I've worked out that, it, you know, I, I got a pretty good idea where it'll translate, particularly in the girls game. Like if a girl is averaging 15, 16, 17 points in the Mac or the Patriot league or the Ivy league, then that equates to about 25 over here. So, uh, you know, that's what I'm looking at. If she's averaging 10 or 11, then, you know, depending on her type of game, she could end up getting 20 here. So it's, it's trying to find those in between. Um, but like the, some of the D3 kids that have come over here have just been ridiculous. 40, 50 point games because they just spit buckets. Because they can, they can do everything. Yeah. yeah and I, like, because all the really good D1 kids will go play pro. Right, right. Here isn't so really you look, pro, so my, son's going to, my son's going to Middlebury. Do you look at the little Ivies? Yeah, we do. Uh, we've had kids from Middlebury here. Uh, uh, at least one girl has been over here from Middlebury. So yeah, yeah, it's a great it's, school. It's that's, where my, that's where my son's going. He he can he can he can shoot the legit three. Like um, you you need to tell him to get in touch with Sport Changes Life. Get him. Yeah, but he's only gonna be he's gonna be a front. I mean, first of all, we're not even sure if he's gonna gap year this year. Is he gonna take a year off? Okay. Um, 
but then uh yeah I'll, I'll definitely keep it in mind when he's when he's getting ready to graduate because he can sh he can legit shoot like legit shoot um but the best thing about this this quarantine is i think he's put on about 10 pounds he's out working right. on his weaknesses it's like good for you like <laughs> he's he's kind of getting like it's part it's part of his routine but um anyway yeah it's uh yeah that's i, I would guess you'd want big kids like yeah, a lot of a lot of the times, you know. Again, you know, for, predominantly, if you look and at most kids coming in here, they're looking for six, seven, six, eight kids. So the ki first of all, the kids that go to little the like a Middlebury or the little Ivies or Ivies are really smart kids. Oh well, yeah, and that's so they're not necessarily going to try to go to Slovenia and play professional. They're yeah. going to go. I want to get a degree and play basketball, and yeah, um, have another year, enjoy it. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Sorry. They're not. They're not chasing. I think a lot of the D one guys, probably on the guys' side, especially, are trying to chase yeah. a dream still. Yeah, yeah, so, yeah. And, and, and that's okay. No problems. And a lot of the D one kids are good. I'm just saying, a lot of them are role orientated. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So, and, and over here, we need to to do a bit of everything. You know, if, if you're you're a six six guard from from D one school, here you're going to be a center, and you're going to be marking some big, massive European. And you're going to get beat up, and it might have been nothing like what you've done back home. Right, but if you're a guard already, you're a guard already. That's the thing yeah. is you can, yeah, yeah, I can see how that Sorry. works. Um, one thing that helped you become a better coach? Uh, listening. Yes. Period. I mean, yeah. yeah. <laughs> uh, best game. Or... Best game you've seen in person. Best game I've seen in person. Um, Australia, NBL semifinals last year, Melbourne United versus Andrew Bogus and the Sydney Kings. Say that again. I am sorry. Australia, the NBL, their professional league. Yep. So last year, the semifinal where uh, Melbourne United played against the Sydney Kings, uh, who had Andrew Bogus. Okay. So, so that's a legit league from what I hear. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I think Lonzo Ball went over there, over there this year. I spend a lot of time. My wife is Australian, so I spend a lot of time watching basketball. And when we go over, I, I see it when I'm over there. So, yeah. Um, and then I guess the other. It's an, inter it's an interesting country in the sense that because I, it's like I said, it's on my bucket list. But people really live on the outside of Australia, right? Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's like all over, you know, for, for such a big, big country. You know, you've, you've got your pockets, but then they're split, split all around. Right. Yeah, it's, it's, that's what intrigues me. Yeah, it's, I almost went to grad school there. Um, Queensland, I, I thought about it. It was close. Um, beautiful country. Beautiful isn't area. It? Beautiful territory. Like, yeah, it's just great. Oh, I know. I, yeah. in some, I, I ended up going to Dartmouth, which is in New Hampshire, which is also very gorgeous. If you've ever been to the east coast of the U.S., gorgeous. But the kid has applied for the program this year. What? Dartmouth has applied for the program this for year. girls or guys guys really yeah yeah well I, I well, I've my I have a player there that's a junior he was second team all Ivy he's legit like legit um great kid um yeah we'll have to keep that in mind I mean he would if he played for you guys you'd win it I'm telling you he's that good like okay. he's legit and he's six six I'm not after we finish that. recording you can tell me you can send me his name I will send you his name um, very smart kid. Uh, do, 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 what? Yeah, I'm not gonna. I'm not gonna share it with anybody else. So the, don't call me any anybody else in in, in Ireland. Um, one word to describe your coaching style. I would say encouraging. Okay, best basketball coach of all time. Oof. I was lucky enough to see a clinic with Coach K and, and meet Doc Rivers that time when they were off and they were touring around actually Asia. I was in Dubai at the time and they spent a couple of days there. Um, and he just struck me, his knowledge. Like I, I know he, he can be a polarizing coach for some people. I understand that. Um, but but you know what? Here's, here's something one of, one of my friends told me. He's polarizing because he wins. Yeah. <laughs> I, I just love the fact that he, he, you know, he gave a really educated answer on every question that came up in that. Class. He's extreme. I mean, you don't go, first of all, Duke is like an Ivy league school. You're, he's not, you're not staying at Duke if you're not smart. He's yeah. coach K is the, the, here's what I tell all the young coaches too. coach K and John Wooden, two of the best coaches probably of all time. Both of them almost lost their jobs. 
like Coach K had like two or three losing seasons to start it until he got that group in. Um, they were ready to get rid of him at Duke. And now look at him. He's like the winningest coach of like of all time on the guy's side. Um, yeah. One book you'd recommend that I think you mentioned it before. Yeah, so I, that, that one, um, so Coaching the Individual in Team Sports by Philip Kerr. So uh, it's, a, it's a quick read. It'll take you about an hour, an hour and 15 minutes to go through it. But he's just got a lot of nuggets. You know, it's one of these ones where I think a lot I got to get him on. I got to get him on. We'll talk about that afterwards. Oh, yeah. Okay. yeah, it'd be, I'd, 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 that'd be an interesting. Because he coaches a different sport. So it's just, it's nice to have that take. I love that. I love having guys. I mean, for, for the, and when we were talking about mentors earlier, the mentor does, I mean, I have mentors that are not coaches of basketball. Like yeah. it's okay to have mentors that do other things um, because, you know, <laughs> how much, how much of our job is X's and O's? That's a great question. Um, I would say less than 30%. Yeah, I would agree with you. 30% is what I have it at. Yep. So. And, and, and if you'd asked me that 20 years ago, I would have said 70%. 70. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Yeah, exactly the same yeah i'm a, i'm a, i'm married to a psychologist literally i like you know if i yeah they, if you can convince it's a special thing from someone that's co i've coached a really long time had some really special teams guys play i mean I, I, I more than a handful of professional athletes a couple nba guys when you get that special like um that special relationship where everything's kind of clicking and everything's kind of going. It's like, it's like lightning. I refer to it as lightning in a bottle. And that, that comes because you've built relationships and they will literally run through a wall for you. And then you can just sit back. Like literally that it's the self coaching. It's the, I'm going to take care of the locker room. Why aren't we winning? Why aren't we executing? Why are you late? All those things don't fall on. I'm just, I'm just along for the ride at that point. And it's, it's a wonderful thing when you can do that. Um, but the young coaches want to run coach K's offense. And, but yeah. defensively, I would run coach Bennett's defense from Virginia. Oh yeah. yeah. Oh yeah. He's legit. Tony's a great guy too. Tony's a great guy. Um, one thing, last question. One thing you would tell a young coach or your young self. Uh, yeah, it, it, probably the biggest thing is to talk to as many coaches, doesn't have to be basketball, like you said, as possible. So just talk about the game, talk about people, talk about leadership, talk about culture. And all these conversations will, will you know, some of it will stick and then little light bulbs. I'm a big believer in light bulbs. Suddenly you're listening to somebody else talking about something. and click. Yeah, I refer to them as golden nuggets. Like. Yeah you find a golden nugget every once in a while and you never know when it's going to like, God, I was talking to a coach a couple of weeks. So I'll give you one that I, I learned and he makes the winners of his contest run rather than the losers. And I go, well, how do you sell that? He goes, well, early in the year, we don't do that. But later in the year, it's like, do you want to get better? Cause if you want to get better, you're going to, you're going to want to run. You're going to want to be in better shape. Yeah. And it was like, Ooh, I like that. I'm going to try that. Absolutely. You know, it's like those yeah. little pieces of like, Oh, that makes sense. That how you talk about it. That's um, yeah. Is that great? Uh, so thank you, coach. I appreciate you taking a, a late Saturday afternoon off. Um, how's the for, weather, right? How's the weather and how's the weather in Ireland in, in May? Well, we, we had rain what over the last three days we've, pro we've probably only had rain over the last three weeks or, or, or two days ago so we've just had two days a little bit of rain a little bit more forecast this week but we've had a lot of sun but it's been cool uh so 18 19 for us over here so okay. that's this so i think that equates to maybe 60 70 60s yeah yeah that's about yeah. You're, you're very similar to us like we're in the 60s yeah. i think it's gonna be 65 today and sunny so okay. um well go enjoy the weather i appreciate you coming on thank you coach thanks so much hey coach hope you enjoyed the video um let me know how we can help make sure you join ttroops.com up above and down below um it is a great resource it's a community it's mentoring for me, one-on-one -on -one calls, office hours. You'll get my personal email address, lots of resources, tons of resources, thousands of resources to, to check out. Uh, I've been there. I've experienced everything you have, won lots of championships, but I want to help you do the same thing. So let me help you. Go over and check it out, teachhoops.com.